I came to this problem where I noticed that many designers couldn't work in tech because they have to make it perfect. Mm. Because what are they taught? They're taught to make it perfect because you cannot ship something that is not imperfect. But mm. in tech, as we know it, you want to ship it incomplete because it's instrumented. You can know whether or not Iran liked it or not. Did he like mm. that first bite or not? Oh, let's change the second bite to something he wants. I'm Ron Dror, and this is Remake, a podcast about design, systems, and society. In each episode, I talk to someone who's trying to change our lives for the better in some meaningful way, whether through a new product, new venture, or a new way of looking at the world. And I try to understand how they came to it, what makes them tick, and what we can learn from them. Today, I'm talking to John Meda. John is an American technologist and product experience leader with a passion for resilience and renewal. He began his early career at MIT at the intersection of computer science and visual design and served there as professor of design and computation and as head of research at the MIT Media Lab. He was a design partner at Kleiner Perkins, held leadership positions with Automatic, the parent company of WordPress.com, and served as president of the Rhode Island School of Design. He's currently serving as chief technology officer of Everbridge. John has been described by the New York Times as an anomaly in the art world, a prize-winning graphic designer and kinetic artist with a fistful of engineering degrees from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He has also been recognized by Esquire as one of the 75 most influential people of the 21st century. And his gorgeous design in tech and resilience in tech reports are a beloved annual ritual for many. We spoke in late July 2022 and excited to talk to John because he's a prolific and fascinating author, teacher, and communicator in the realm of design. I loved his design in tech reports while in Kleiner Perkins and enjoyed his voice on Twitter. We talked about how he started his journey working at his parents' tofu shop in Seattle getting his first Apple computer, why his mother was his first VC, the difference between good and bad teachers, and his journey from engineering school at MIT to art school, the need for creatives to understand money and how money works, teaching at the famous MIT Media Lab, and growing the people that will end up destroying you professionally. We also cover being a humanist technologist and what it means, issues of complexity and simplicity, why he's quoted as saying design is not that important, is design useful and in what way, how to speak machine and many other topics. John made many good points about complexity and simplicity, the role of a good teacher, and much more. But what stayed with me is his vision of the computer as a new alien species and the importance of seeing technology with fresh and wondering eyes. It's only in this way that we can understand the radical newness of what we're living through. This conversation is one of a dozen or so weekly conversations we already have lined up for you with thinkers, designers, makers, authors, and entrepreneurs who are working to change our world for the better. So follow this podcast on your favorite podcast app or head over to remakepod.org to subscribe. And now let's jump right in with John Maida. All right. I'm sitting here across the screen from John Maida. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. And so I like to start the conversation these days uh, because the world is very eventful these days and one event after another with this question. What, what is it like to be you in the world today? Well, I think it's pretty easy to be me. I think if anything, that's the thing we learn how to do best. And it's why we screw up so many things because we tend to fit things to how we think they're supposed to be. So everything is all 
as best as could be with me. I like to set my standard as, am I not in the hospital with tubes attached to me? <laughs> if I'm not, I'm really awesome. That's, uh, that's a good standard and a standard that keeps you, uh, keeps you happy. I have a lot of stresses in my business. And just yesterday, I thought, do any of these stresses are going to affect how my cat is going to eat and how I'm going to eat? And if, because I don't have kids in the family. And the truth is, they won't. And so everything puts everything in perspective. And so to dive into the exploration of, of the many, many amazing topics that we could cover today, I'd love to ask our kind of standard opening question, which is, What's something you learned in childhood or early in life that still guides or drives you today? I think the thing I learned as a kid growing up in a, a shop, a store, you know, when you work with your parents as a kid, you understand that life isn't easy and school mm. is actually really easy compared to working that way. I think I came to realize that what I thought was important on the product side of mm -hmm. the tofu that we made for customers, I thought that was really important, the quality of it, the craftsmanship of it. Mm -hmm. But now I'm really more aware that it was the warmth and trusting front-end customer side. The customer success, success manager was my mom, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she's from Hawaii. And I think everyone wanted to see my mom. And it just so happened that the tofu was good. Nice. So I think it's that human touch, the human connection that makes a whole difference. You can call that, you can call that design if you want. We can call that customer experience. You can call it anything you want to call it today. But it's that human thing, the thing that I trust. Mm. Yeah, and making people feel, feel like they're understood and they're seen. Uh, so I'm just in the in recent maybe two years started appreciating tofu. You know, is do you have some wisdom around tofu? Because I know you have wisdom around many other topics, yeah. but how can you know how, how could I learn to appreciate that more? I wish I could help you there. I don't I don't have access to good tofu, really. So mm. I I forget a lot, but it's like a good cheese. If you're mm. a European and you like cheese and you come to the States. And you're like, what is this? <laughs> I think that's what the difference in good tofu really is. It's that subtlety. It's the presentation. It's everything that you would expect compared with getting a slice of processed American cheese wrapped in plastic. Mm. I guess a pro tip for good tofu might be if you see it cut unevenly, that means it was probably handmade versus made in a machine. That may mm. be a good uh, indication <laughs> that nice. you're getting a artisanal tofu. Nice. And the same way when you get cheese. If the cheese is too perfect, you're like, oh, this is a process by someone. But if yeah. it's kind of irregular and a little bit kind of weird looking, you're like, oh, this, this could be a good cheese. There you go. So we got, I got some tofu uh, tips. That's amazing. So you told the story of getting an Apple II computer while working at the tofu shop and learning to program on that computer, did that lead you into direct, kind of a direct route into engineering? Were you still thinking about which way should I go? What made you start with engineering? Well, the simple reason I got interested in engineering is because the people who would come to the tofu store were either regular people who do all kinds of things or even like our... our um, our customers, our enterprise customers, basically restaurants and things, they were restaurant owners. And a lot of blue collar people would come to a shop at our place because it was cheaper, the more high end stuff. And once in a while, you'd see someone show up in a nicer than average car. And mm. they happened to work at Boeing, which at the time was the Microsoft or Amazon of the era. And they happened to be an engineer. And I was like, whoa, what is that? But the reason why I had an Apple II, there's two reasons why. Number one, you know, where I grew up, I grew up in a part of Seattle that was not wealthy by any means. It was considered a primarily uh, African American, Samoan American neighborhood. And I was bused across Seattle 
as part of a program that came from the civil rights movement where the schools that we had weren't very good, where the schools that were in the nice part of Seattle were much better. So they bust us over to the nice part of Seattle. Mm -hmm. And that's where I discovered that there's this thing called a computer in the math class. And I thought, wow, what is this thing? Number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, you know, my parents had no money or education and they wanted their kids to do well. So any money they saved, they would invest in kids. And so I don't know how they saved to get me an Apple II, which is expensive object in the day. Mm. And um, said, we want you to succeed. You know, it was my mom was the, my mom was my VC. So I mean, <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. She was the one who like uh, put the seed round in for me. Yeah, she saw the entrepreneurial potential. That's uh, so. It, it's an interesting. You have a really interesting journey because you start with engineering at MIT, right? And then you go th- and, and go to an art school, a design school, and then you end up also doing an MBA on top of that. So I'd love to understand that journey a little bit. What was each one of these stations like, and why did you feel the need to take that that next step? Well, I I have trouble when I talk with the younger people who meet me and say that they want to do what I did. So tell me the secret to how that all happened. But I think anyone, like even yourself, if someone said, hey, how do I become like you, Iran? And you'd be like, I don't know. A lot of accidents happened and um, a lot of failure occurred along the way too. Mm. So I think that Everyone likes the shiny parts of the story and misses the fact that a lot of unfortunate things happen too. You know, for me, I didn't know there was anything else besides having a job that could make money. And the one job that I could do that could be this engineering thing. <laughs> you know, I know what mm-hmm. it was. And ended up at MIT and the thing that people don't tell you if you're a first generation to go to college is it's really hard. Uh, <laughs> you have no bearings on what is this thing, university? You can ask your parents like what it is. And in my case, they're like, they have no idea too. And I realized I was so behind everyone. So that was engineering. And then I discovered that I was good at engineering, like writing code and creating visual representations of things. I didn't know what design was, and I found it in the library. I found a book by Paul Rand, and I thought, wow, this person is really good at visual representation of things. And I was good at the combo, but I wasn't really good at the visual representation after I saw what he did. So I thought, wow, this design thing seems really interesting. And there was a woman named Muriel Cooper at MIT who was art director at MIT Press. And she was a professor at the Media Lab. Mm. And she suggested that I go to art school, that I would never get what I'm looking for in a technology program. So I ended up in art school, stopped using computers, and that was a really happy time. But then the neat thing about good teachers is there's always bad teachers. Mm. Because a bad teacher is pretty selfish and really kind of <laughs> has an overwrought sense of what how things should be. A good teacher is like really curious about growth. Like what happens if this plant grows taller? Not will the plant grow tall enough to overshadow me, right. which is what some I think even leaders are afraid of when their team members get too good. And so in art school, I had a mentor who really wanted to see what I could do. I, and also, I had someone who was his next door neighbor who was really grumpy all the time. And so I remember like waiting to see the good teacher, and then he wasn't there yet. And so the bad person like pulled me into his office and closed the door. And he spent, hmm. I don't know, like a half an hour telling me how I would never become anything important <laughs> in life. Wow. And how all my work was stupid and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, whoa. Contrast with a good teacher. You know, he said to me, like, okay, so 
what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to become a classic typographer like you. And he called me an idiot. He said, that's so stupid because you're good at this computer thing. And so you should do things that only you can do while you're young mm -hmm. and wait till you're older to go back to the classics. So that kind of wow. gave me the license freedom to just go back into computers. I bought a Next computer and began writing code again. And the nice thing about engineering is you can build anything. The nice thing about learning art and design is you learn what to build, but sometimes you can't build it. So it happened in a moment where I could know what I want to build mm. and could build it myself. But then going to your last MBA question, that track went along for quite a while. And then I realized that money controls everything. You talked about feeding your cat and feeding yourself. And no. you know, no one in art and design or even technology at the time really talks about money because it's evil and bad and all these things. So hmm. I thought I would get an MBA to understand like, what is it that they're saying? What is this language? And it hmm. freed me to understand that I was ignorant. And I, I wish I had knew, known sooner what I know now. Hmm. Yeah, you, you said in one of your talks, you kept hearing the phrase, don't worry about the money. So you started worrying about the money. I, I do feel like there's a, uh, an approach with the artsy crowd. that They're seen as the, the creatives to be kept in some sort of room. And they don't know about money. And we know we'll, we'll pay them however much we can get away with paying them. And, you know, and, and it, all, it sort of serves us that they don't, know about money because i think the truth is that some of these creative folks will probably run the company if they knew about money or or, or would leave to start a company you know a better company i think the way you framed it is important to note who wants to be able to enable a competition to happen an enlightened leader wants it because mm -hmm. more competition is more exciting maybe a more conservative leader who is less confident the last thing he wants is eran who's the best leader on the team making a new firm that could take him out if he understood what money is about. <laughs> right, right. But don't worry, Anand doesn't care about the money. He just yeah. loves creativity and we'll get him yeah. a nice chair and a uh, good table, good stationery. He'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you ended up, so this is, you know, after this fascinating track, you end up being a professor at the MIT Media Lab and you know, you, you had some really interesting experiments. In your memory, what stands out the most from this period? I think what stands out is I was building startups. Startups are basically talents. I, I was able to acquire a lot of incredible talent in the world because I could offer a free MIT master's degree. And so uh -huh. I attracted people who were unusual, who could have probably made a lot of money. <laughs> mm. who could have gone and made it a real startup. But they all showed up at MIT and I was lucky to enable their careers. People like Ben Fry, Casey Rees, Golan Levin, Peter Cho, Tom White. They're all people very active in the Web3 world and computational generative art world. And mm. the list is quite long. And the list of students that they made is quite long. And so when I look back, I was funding a talent, uh, <laughs> a talent, a talent camp. Right. Um, it's kind of like those, uh, those uh, Korean sort of boy bands or girl bands. <laughs> That's kind of what I, accidentally. I had the advantage that when I began at MIT, I had already built my career. So I already was well-known. So I didn't need to feed off of the talents to become more successful, if that makes sense. Mm. I, I could be there for them to see if they could succeed. And really, the thing I learned from my, my good mentor in Japan was the goal is to see if you can create people who come after you who can destroy you one day. Nice. So I look at my goal during that era, I was extremely successful. 
Uh, because, because after a few years, I realized, oh my gosh, they're so much better than me than this thing that I did. And I was one of maybe, what, 100 people maybe maximum on earth doing that. Mm. And they were all so incredible. So when people ask me why I'm not active in computational this, that, or whatever, uh, I just realized that the people that I had the fortune of working with really kind of went beyond what I could imagine. So I shouldn't mm. get in their way. Yeah. And so you, call, you called yourself a humanist technologist. I'd love to understand what does that mean? And what's the difference between a technologist and a humanist? And what, why do both of these things, why is it important to bring both of these aspects? Well, that's a term I synthesized in the 90s. Another term I synthesized was post-digital because I was hoping to imagine what's happening after digital. And in the humanist technologist, I was at a technology institution. So I was trying to remind myself that technology can't solve everything. So in the 90s, I think that was how I would refer to myself, looking what's happening after digital, post-digital, trying to be a humanist technologist, in particular because MIT's history is all based in weaponry for wartime. Most people I aren't aware that, that most wow. of the research universities are built on funding from the military, the research side at least, computer science, the internet, that all came from the military. And I had the fortune at MIT to know people who worked on the Manhattan Project, hmm. which is considered one of the most incredible feats in science to have access to unlimited money to break the code on how to build this weapon. And many of the scientists who work on this project, after the bombs exploded and killed people in Japan, yeah. they realized that there's implications to the technology that they create. And they were no longer just technologists. So my humanist technologist point came out of the fact that I knew these people who were all worried about what happens in the future when more technologists grow up in an era where they never experienced war and understood what weapons can really do to harm people. Think of the uh, Nobel Prize. We all love the Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace Prize, Nobel whatever prize. But that came from Alfred Nobel, who invented dynamite. One of the yep. greatest inventions yep. that uh, was incredibly useful to the mining industry because mining industry was accelerated, but it also became the most incredible weapon in the field of war. So yeah. you look at Nobel Prize and it's about peace, but it, it came from a technology that helped and harmed. Yeah, the, the story is that Alfred Nobel felt really guilty for the harms and realizing and then put, he put all of his money into trying to do something for world peace and science and progress. So you, you wrote that technologists do because they can and humanists do because they care. So does this ca well, capture... Well, I've written a lot of things on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> now I think people realize that microblogging lacks context. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I used to use Twitter uh, microblogging as a kind of therapy, which many people do. It's like a public mm -hmm. therapy that... Hopefully nobody's reading, but then someone finds it and they're like, oh my gosh, you said this, whatever. Well, I said it to myself and maybe you overheard it. Yeah, you have a lot of followers. So I would guess people read your, uh, your therapy posts. Luckily, the, most of them are cats and robots, I think. <laughs> and so I don't think number. I'm terribly popular in that way. But um, I found it useful to find these things I said in the past because they remind me of when I was younger mm. and believed I had clarity. Mm. And when I wrote that, you know, it's like Alzheimer's patients when they hear music, they can remember something they felt in that era. And so mm. when I read something I wrote in a microblog post, I'm like, oh yeah, I used to think that way. In that era, I knew a lot of technologists, uh, specifically at MIT, 
who really just wanted to invent the forefront of science. It's mm. not different when you hear like tech companies and the CEO wants to push AI to the limits and make lots of money. It's that same kind of exciting, juicy future kind of thing. Mm. I think humanists, however, and I would contrast humanists with technologists, and that humanists are bound to the idea of humanity and history and have thought of the world as more a place of people mm. than technology and waves of technology. And I think that their perspective tends to not make a lot of money, but needs to be heard. Yeah. And um, I began to hear that voice more clearly. Yeah. I, I want to also note that because I came from a blue-collar family with no books in the house, I have a very limited liberal arts native capacity. So mm. I just picked it up later in life. So when you hear me talk about these things, it's because I began from a survival mentality and then began to be able to move more broadly, understand the world in terms of business and humanity. Mm. So my naivete is revealed in everything I used to write. Mm. Yeah, and there's this really, I don't know if how familiar or uh, interested you are in Zen, but I think a core principle of Buddhism is this idea of emptiness, which I think goes to the heart of the inherent limitation of, of words and definitions and absolute statements. And, you know, when things are interdependent mm -hmm. and really hard to separate are not non-separate, mm -hmm. any absolute statement is trying to kind of separate them into neat boxes, but that's not really possible. How does the emptiness help? So I think it helps by letting go of the illusion that you can have totally clear, fully beautifully captured thoughts and you start working more statistically, more vaguely, more approximately. That's interesting. Never thought of it that way. It explains why that approach is less popular in mm. general society. It requires letting go of the heroic savior. Yeah. Because I think a lot of us are conditioned to like the tallest, loudest voice in the room says they're going to save us. And we're like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think the in, in Buddhism in general, the feeling is that the only precise thing you can say is a negation. You can be absolutely 100% true that something is false, is that something oh. is not the case. But anything positive is going to be problematic. Whoa, I got to think about that one. Okay, whoa, that's going to take a while. Okay, I'm going to do a uh, Google search after this conversation. <laughs> so thank you, Aaron. <laughs> No, no. I mean, it's, uh, that's uh, it's my uh, bread and butter. That's my I I did my master's degree in in Buddhist philosophy, so that's where I'm. Um, oh, okay. Super. That's cool. Uh, super invested. So you wrote about the laws of simplicity, and I, I, again, I think that the title implies a more absolutist stance than you're actually taking. But what can we know about simplicity and complexity? What have you found? You know, I just gave a new person I'm working with, the laws of simplicity. I haven't like looked at it at all for a while and it's like in a cupboard of things and I was like, oh yeah, this book, maybe I, this person might be able to understand where I used to be from, what I used to think. Mm. And I think that I lived in a much less complex world at the time. Mm. And I was seeing technology rise and design's point of view obscured. So I think that the laws of simplicity was a way to bring to the foreground classical design thinking in the context of technology, user experiences, products. Mm. I think for that reason, it was unusually timely and valuable to the industry. And even to this day, I meet so many people who read that book, and I'm perplexed because even now, when someone tells me that, they will add, it refers to a DVD player 
and an iPod with a scroll wheel. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, it gives you a sense of like how dated it is. That said, I think if you look at my later thinking, it's been about organizations, people, change mm. management, tectonic shifts in industry. They're inherently about complexity. Mm. And I think people ask me, why don't I have a simpler way to understand everything if I was so big on simplicity? I think it's because I've come to realize that complexity is the norm and entropy is only increasing and people don't like it. And if you give them something too simple, not complex enough, things can go in the wrong direction. And there's this quote, right, about the simplicity on the other side of complexity, which I used to quite like. But I think what you're adding here is that to reach any sort of functional, whatever, functional solution, you have to address the complexity and engage with it. And the process itself is complex. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, you, have to do the, you have to do the work. I think simplicity implies that I don't have to do the work. But given the nature of everything that we know in the world and what we can know in the world, oversimplifications are creating harm. I stand on the side of really enjoying going deep in anything complex Mm -hmm. and attempting to pull out the signal from the noise but with a thread attached to it. Read Mm. more. So Mm. you can read more once you find it interesting, but I don't like to calcify it into that one simple nugget because that misses opportunity to learn. You're listening to Remake, a podcast about design systems and society. If you're listening on a podcast app, you already know how to follow podcasts. So please follow this one. If you're listening in a browser, just go to remakepod.org to find links to all the major podcast players where you can follow our show. And so before getting into your latest book, I'm interested in this Fast Company article where you're quoted as saying, design is not that important. And I know that it is not exactly what you said, but obviously it's it's challenging to hear as a designer, as someone who's really believing in design. But I want to understand the truth of where it's coming from and what's your criticism of design And where do you think it should fit in the overall system? Well, apparently that article was one of the most successfully performing article on Fast Company. (laughs) Not surprised. (laughs) Yeah, not surprised. I got so much hate mail for a while. It was like hate mail, hate tweets, hate everything. Was it at least well-designed hate mail? It was from all these people that I I knew and I was like, or admired. And I was like, whoa. And there's all these posts about how clueless I am for saying that and It was really good. I like criticism, mind you. Mm. So when all those messages started coming to me, people would say like, are you okay? Are you okay? And I was like, (laughs) oh, this is not a big deal. No one has formed an effigy of me and burning it on fire like has happened to me. Or (laughs) no one has created an entire failure campaign of stickers everywhere, all over. You know, no one's spit at me. So Mm. to me, I say like, eh, you know? This is like a meme. And let's study this. So I studied it and I learned so many things. And there were some people who were like agreeing with me. And they would say what they're agreeing with me. And I was like, I don't think I ever thought that, but (laughs) that's interesting. In terms of what I meant to say, which I really truly believe, is that design is an important component of building products and services that are meaningful to both consumer and enterprise, it's the fact that design is hard to quantify from a financial perspective. 
mm. that makes it hard to get buy-in. It's the fact that design is sometimes attributed to the marketing creative side, and it's mm. lightly attributed to the product side if it smells UXy. And it's hard to understand internally. So what is understandable is engineering. You know, you build the railroad track. You build the train that goes on the railroad track. Mm. The train make it from point A to point B. That's important. Everyone understands that. Uh, how much money it might make, how much money it costs to hire all those people matters to business folks. How fast can you ship it? Manage mm. to the product people as a holistically. I think that design as a key ingredient has always been seen as a nice to have, sometimes a need to have. But because it's a hard discipline to understand, it gets stuck. And so mm. people think it's not important. And so that's why a lot of my interest is connecting the business world into, well, specifically the product world, into understanding where design makes an impact and not mm. the engineering world. You mentioned design systems, you know, with code, it makes a difference or not. But many things that are considered in the design space, when you bring them to the startup or the corporate space, are really not useful because mm. they're about beauty, which is the most important thing. There's a difference between important and useful. <laughs> yeah. We can all argue that something beautiful is important, right? It's like, oh my gosh, of course I want that to be like that. That's beautiful. That's conceptually beautiful. But is it useful or not? It might not be. So right. design as a discipline understands this other piece that other disciplines do not understand. Mm. So when we say design's important to everyone, and then everyone starts leaning in, and they're confused. Edan, why do you believe that that should be set in Inter versus uh, Calibri, which is free? <laughs> or something? Yeah. And you're like, yeah. well... No one's using Inter. It's sort of more optimized. It was designed by Rasmus. It was, it's like a much more efficient, more beautiful, whatever. And like, yeah, but is that useful or not to the user or not? Mm. And so people, we get stuck in these things over here. Meanwhile, when design is able to argue that if we componentize this in collaboration with engineers, we can ship products so much faster because we remove the translation right. of idea to experience. Like yeah. that kind of design right now in tech is so much more important than the other arguments that that I love to have, mind you, mm. but I personally can't afford to make right now as someone who's trying to pull these things together. Yeah. Well, so uh, two two thoughts about that. Well, one is... Can you when, reinterpret with your Zen mind what I said to you so I understand what I said? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do my best. So, well, so I, I guess there's different meanings to the word design, and I think you alluded to that in your writing. When I talk about design and, and its importance, I, I, I don't mean fonts, but what I mean is design thinking and the practice of empathy and the practice of understanding the user and synthesizing information in the right way and bringing people together to co-create and so I, as I think in that, in that way, it's interesting. But I think a lot of the um, controversy is like, who should be in charge? And I find that like a really boring question. You know, one of the most interesting practices I've seen is from Intuit, where they have this, these triads. And the triad is like a product person, a technical person, and a design person. And there's no hierarchy between them. They just need to make decisions together as they're working on a product or a feature. And I like that. So the product is not the boss of the designer. The product person has a more senior product person above them. And the designer has a more senior designer above them. And the technologist has a more senior technologist above them. But they are working on this feature together and they need to make a decision together. And because there are three, you can even, you know, there's many ways to do it. You can vote, you can talk it out. And I find that fascinating, this idea that it's, these are just different voices that can have a conversation and reach an agreement, and they, it doesn't, doesn't need to be a hierarchy between them. What do you, do you, have you thought about the hierarchy aspect? or 
Uh, well, well, I'm, 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 uh, your podcast, you can't include smiles, but I'm smiling <laughs> hearing this because that triad works mm. when you have product design, which we could also attribute to industrial design, functional mm. design, sure. and engineering and product, right? I think inevitably, though, you have to sell it. So it bumps into marketing at some point, marketing and sales. Sure. And as we know, that's more of the look and feel, the smell design. You said you don't care about fonts, et cetera, but some people do. No. And even some product designers do too, because they were trained that way. So sure. I guess my point is that the kinds of engineers range from like front end to back end. The kind of product and business people range from commercial to consumer. There's a range, right? Sure. I think the design range in this tech era of what product design is has much more variation. Mm. So I think that it's hard to get that triad to work is all I'm saying. I think mm. a triad is a really good idea. Yeah, no, and it, and it definitely there's a lot that they do to make it work. Like they, you know, everybody has to go through the right training for it, design thinking and their whole ideology of design, et cetera. So getting to how to speak machine, I want to start with this. So you, you actually, in, in one of your talks, you share this quote from David Boy, this segment from David Boy about the internet. And he is so perfect that he's like a, a prophet this is 1999 and he says mm -hmm. the internet carries the flag of being subversive possibly rebellious and chaotic nihilistic he says i don't think we've seen the tip of the iceberg it's almost as if we're on the cusp of something both exhilarating and terrifying it's an alien life form and the interviewer is just like but it's just a technical tool like it's he's not getting it at all and and I and then you proceed to present to explain to us this alien life form and the machine and how, and you know how we interact with it and so tell me what made you want to write this book and then maybe the arc of it how you're telling that story. Well, I realized that this triad you're describing, like product engineering design or this marketing design product design schism, I think that this is something that a lot of terrific leaders are trying to make clearer to more leaders at different levels. I realized that the one problem that remained is many business people don't understand how computation works. Mm. And many designers don't either. So I thought it important, at least for myself, to understand it myself. And I thought that the David Bowie moment of like wow he really called it it is an alien life form i know it because when my mom got me the apple too i was like well, this is a strange alien like creature so that's why i took apart my understanding of how computation works in digital products and services today in six pieces and it took me six years to do that so, <laughs> so when, when, when people when people read this book, it's a very simple book, but it, it took me so long. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I can see why it's it, it's so dense in terms of just the understanding of these principles, and they build on top of each other. And so we I, we could pull up any one of them, but I, I think there's a couple that are especially fascinating. So one aspect is the you say machines are living, and so. In, in what sense, and we all know that there's a difference between our computers and our phones and just inanimate products, right? Like this coffee mug. But in, in what sense are they living and what's the importance of that? Let me give an example from classical design. Let's say I was a furniture designer. Let's say my name was much fancier, Johan Madavista or something, whatever. And I've designed this incredible chair. I'm at the uh, Salon de Meubles, the furniture fair in Italy. The chair right. is a group of trees that grow in the shape of anyone who comes and comes close to it and mm. sits in it. And it stays that way for centuries and you only have to feed it water every day, and it, it does this magical thing. And you would look at me and say, 
oh, that's impossible, Johan. <laughs> There's no material that could do that, you know, mm. forever in perpetuity and keep changing. Yes, we'll come back tomorrow. It's going to be completely different. And you're like, that's impossible. It's a tree. Living objects in our world don't change that quickly and can't be programmed down to that level. Whereas computation can fully be controlled in that way. And mm. you don't have to feed it water. You just feed it uh, AWS compute cycles. And it just no. sort of lives there. It's alive. What makes it worse, however, is that I'm Johan. I'm showing up at the furniture fair. I'm telling the audience that I have one million of these chairs spread across the entire earth now being presented live. Mm. And they yeah. all do the same thing, but completely differently, depending upon who's out there. And everyone's like, Johan, that's insane. How could you do that on so many places on earth? It's because the computation that David Bowie described is living and controllable at a very unusual scale that we haven't fully understood mm. everywhere. Mm. And, you, and you also say the machines are incomplete. And that that creates imbalance. And so help me to understand that piece. I came to this problem where I noticed that many designers couldn't work in tech because they have to make it perfect. Mm. Because what are they taught? They're taught to make it perfect. Because you cannot ship something that is not imperfect. But mm. in tech, as we know it, you want to ship it incomplete. Because it's instrumented. You can know whether or not Iran liked it or not. Did he like that first bite or not? Oh, let's change the second bite to something he wants. That's why things can be shipped incomplete. It's because of this living alien material that we've never had on Earth until a few decades ago. Hmm. So why does that create imbalance? Going back to my analogy of I'm Johan, I've made this incredible bench made out of living trees I showing it off at the furniture fair, and I have millions of installations around Earth at the same time. What if I made the chair incorrectly where it will kill someone by accident? I forgot that the branches should not be sharp or whatever. What if I did that? It would be okay if I was at the furniture fair and we're all sitting down and having a coffee and we're all laughing about the chair and like, oh, oh someone's getting hurt, so let's move them away. Mm. But I've done it at the scale of millions of of chairs around the earth that I'm not there to be accountable for. Yeah. I think that's the imbalance that we see occurring today. Yeah. However, I want to note that anyone who understands computation, who can speak machine, will tell you quickly, in the era of computation, we can also rewind systems, right? I can rewind a feature. Mm -hmm. I think that's another powerful part of the ecosystem of incomplete. Yeah. is that our system is so highly evolved that I can get my furniture reliability engineering team, <laughs> my, my FRE, <laughs> yeah. sort of like, you know, let, let, let's rewind the release and then things could be okay. Mm -hmm. But you need that ability to recover quickly, which all the tech companies are generally really good at doing. Yeah, you might not be able to pull back on the damage you've done to the human bodies. You might not, exactly, 100%. That may make me immediately think about Facebook and the way that we are being optimized by these algorithms. Once you give the algorithm a task that involves our behavior, we are part of the system that the algorithm is optimizing. And if we need to be changed to get to the goal, then we'll slowly be changed and molded. Yes, and you know, one thing that I've been cognizant of is that Industry has always worked in this way, shipping incomplete, instrumenting, using data. There was a project at CMU in the 90s, like Archangel. It was a project to show that with just your, this is in the United States, with just your birthday and zip code, they know exactly who you are. <laughs> Even back then, before there were computers, there were like large data tables where the world understood us. We were being marketed to, mm. shaped, etc. So mm. I just want to note that the problem is that it's been automated at this incredible scale. Mm. And to your point, Iran, 
the danger that can occur is definitely a several orders of magnitude higher than in the past. Mm. That said, I'm not a Luddite and saying that stop forever and nobody should do these kinds of things or whatnot. I feel the danger is being able to speak machine or not being able to speak machine because many of our leaders don't speak machine, don't speak mm. this product engineering design triad. They don't. So it's very abstract to them. Mm. So, so you got really interested in resilience. I think two, two recent pieces of proof is uh, the tech report, the resilience in tech report that you put out this year, and the fact that you are involved with Everbridge, which is all about making organizations more resilient. So what is this fascination about resilience? And tell me how you're seeing us being able to improve resilience in the world. Well, it goes back to this thing about imbalance. And mm. my point about how speaking machine is important because otherwise you may create imbalance. Mm. But speaking machine is also important if you want your company to do better than the competition. And I think that resilience is the same way. Uh, either during the pandemic, your organization prospered or it faltered. And it's been different if you understand not how to speak machine, but how to speak risk. Risk is like the word design. It's pretty vague. Mm. And my favorite definition of risk comes from a person whose nickname is Dr. Risk. His name is Dr. Hilson. And he says, risk is uncertainty that matters. It's a very simple mm. sentence, yeah. but it's pretty important. And you, do you want to tell us a little bit more about Everbridge and you know the the, the current solution that you're building, or you know, and how, how it addresses that? Sure. Well, let's think about uncertainty. Mm. And something happens. It's often called boom. The moment that boom happens, boom is usually a, a bad boom. Boom, mm. it happened. There is a time after the boom, and there's a time before the boom when you could have prepared. Right. Usually called left of boom before it happens, or right of boom after it happens. Right. Most technologies for resilience have been created to manage during the boom and after the boom. Mm. Uh, technologies like, this happened, let's notify everyone. And let's get everyone safe because you received a text message. Mm. So that's the history of Everbridge and a large part of this resilience industry, whether at the country level or corporate level. Let's tell everyone to get out of the way. Let's tell everyone how to get safe. The left the boom side, though, is where new growth is occurring. Before the boom happens, mm. maybe you want to know that it's going to happen. Or... Maybe you want to know that these kind of things happen a lot. You can imagine this in work, your own work, mm. right? You're like, oh my gosh, I have seven podcasts scheduled for today. I, I wish someone told me. <laughs> you know, so that, that's right. a boom moment. Right. So you, you want systems that are data-oriented that say, Iran, I think maybe you want to reschedule the next podcasts that are happening over the next two weeks, move them out kind of thing. You've, you've looked at my calendar. There you go. Exactly. Well, it's, it's relevant, right? You care about the boom. And left of boom traditionally was difficult technologically because it required data. Mm. So we've moved in the last decade to a data-rich environment from a data-poor environment. Mm. So Everbridge began right of boom, and we cover left of and right of boom. And that's why I was hired to look at this entire end-to-end -end recovery capability as oh. resilience in technologies. The boom arc. That sounds fascinating. So I have one final question for you, which is our standard closing question. Um, mm, yes. In his TED Talk, the philosopher Alain de Botton talks about the difference between a lecture and a sermon. A lecture being this informational, dry way of delivering some information and the listener makes up their own mind. And a sermon, which he longs for, 
is an urgent plea that takes the listener seriously and, 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 and kind of grabs them to help them change their life. If you had a chance to give a short sermon on any topic, what would it be about? I've been a fan of Elan Beton's work. I remember like, like first hearing about it and I was eating everything. I was like, oh, I got to eat this. I got to eat that. I got to try this, try that. So I, I'm not surprised that he would find such a kind of cogent way to describe uh, two things there. I don't know if I, I can do it justice because sermons to me sound a bit dangerous sort mm. of given how we are today, knowing that religion is powerful and religion is delivered through sermons. I think we have too many sermons now. Lectures are usually seen as dry and uninteresting, but I recently saw a lecture by Richard Feynman, no. the famous physicist. Love and Richard Feynman. It was so engaging. That wasn't a sermon, it was a lecture, and I was like, wow, this is really interesting. But Feynman also gave some, some good sermons in his life, I would say. You know, about ah. the fragility of information or... It's a topic that I definitely don't claim to have expertise around, but I have dissonance around. Hmm. Just because I think there are so many political sermons and ideological sermons out there that it uh, makes me a little nervous. I would add a third category, if I could, which is short form video, five second. <laughs> All right. Five or two second clips. Okay. Which, for the life of me, I don't understand, but I experience and I can appreciate. I don't know what that is. It's like listening to the noise has become the hobby mm. of everyone to find and synthesize signals. So I'm really interested in, in the, the two-second short. What would the content of that two-second video would be? Well, you know, it's funny because um, after How to Speak Machine, I was a bit lost. Because I was like, I think it's good enough. It's shipped incomplete, as all things are. And I think that kind of explains what I think is computation. Some software people say, oh, it's a terrible book because it's not accurate. And I was like, that wasn't the point. Mm. Or some design people say, oh, I hate when you talk about design. It's like design has nothing to do with that. I said, I don't know. Mm. But I like what business people say to me. They say, I finally understand what those people are doing. I did that. It's as good as I can make it before I die. So now I'm interested in business. I want to explain business to what I call makers. I love makers versus talkers. The mm. makers are the people that make the stuff. The talkers are the people who make money off of the makers and don't make anything. Yeah. Yeah. And talkers, generally speaking, are the business people who are very important because otherwise you can't feed your cat or you can't, you can't feature whatever. So I want to make it easier for makers to understand and appreciate business. So I started as my sort of side hacking project. I'm running the infrastructure for what I'm calling the useful MBA, which mm. I want to deliver through two-second fragments or 15-segment, whatever, through a special app I'm developing to test this hypothesis that there's a different way to get your B-School game on. Mm. Well, that's, uh, that's a good enough sermon for me. Uh, I, I want to thank okay. you so much for taking the time today, for going through these topics with me while it's scorching hot. Thank you so much, John. I, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Aaron, for having me. Appreciate it too. Remake is produced by myself and Regina Rothstein. Research and editing by Louis Brady and audio engineering by Greg Cocoveos. If you enjoyed the podcast, please consider writing a five-star review in Apple's podcast or wherever you're listening. It helps many more people discover the podcast and also just makes us feel good. Current support for the podcast comes from my own design company, Remake Labs. We're a global strategic design speed agency aimed at improving outcomes through repeated and rapid design interventions. Now, until next time, be well, everyone, and see you next week on Remake. <laughs>